Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today is Dr. Shayla Toons Withers, and she's going to be talking about food as medicine and how you can actually eat your way off of your medications. Please welcome her to the show. I love that title because so many people have eaten their way onto medications. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, as a, as a family physician, we, we see people all the time suffering from all of these different diseases. And a lot of it really is, is what we put on our plate. And so uh, I love to tell patients that not only, you know, what you eat can lead to these things, but what you eat can also reverse these things. So, yeah. I think a lot of people don't know that. And even if, and a lot of people maybe don't even believe it. Right. That's the thing. A lot of people, a lot of people don't know and a lot of people don't believe, but just I've been practicing for about 12 years and just over time, I I have personally seen the proof um, when, you know, patients do make these lifestyle changes and follow these, these changes from what they've typically been consuming and doing it is proof. I've taken people off of insulin. I've removed blood pressure medications, um, taken people, you know, off of their cholesterol medications. And so it it really is. It's true. It does work. How did you get interested in practicing medicine this way? Yeah. So just uh, really, I always held an interest um, in preventative care um, from an aspect of just seeing things that people suffered from in my own family. Um, and then after completing my training um, in family medicine, I just found myself seeing more and more people who were suffering from these uh, common chronic diseases that we see in the, our country, diabetes and uh, blood pressure and uh, people suffering from heart attacks and strokes and um, just, you know, the overall resounding theme to that, a lot of it was what we eat. Um, even within my own health, I really did a deep dive into the nut- nutrition side of things um, after finding out that I was severely lactose intolerant. I used to get like debilitating stomach cramps and, and everything. Every time that I ate and I had the, you know, what we call the million dollar workup, uh, where you get all of these tests and things done and there was nothing wrong. It was just what I was consuming. And so just taking a, a deep dive even more. Um, into the things we consume and how they play a part in our body and how they play a part in our health. Um, And then looking more at the research. So, um, you know, some of our our fathers of of plant-based nutrition and plant-based health. Uh, So when, you know, some of the things you first see, you see the China study out there and you uh, see Forks Over Knives, some of our older um, literature that are out there. And so I, I stumbled across and discovered those things and looked at really the science and the scientific studies um, that were done by those doctors. And you couldn't deny it. You know, I wish there was more, um, you know, that, are, that have even been done. And we know that there, you know, for a number of reasons that hasn't been, but just seeing that and then seeing the part it played within myself and the part that it played within others um, just really led me down this road to want to do more. Did you learn any of this in medical school? Um, not, no, not much. <laughs> Nutrition side. So what we learned in medical school, you know, we learn about disease and why disease is there. And, you know, what you learn all these pathways, you know, the pathway to this and the pathway to that and what you can target with this medication to do this and that and the other. But the nutrition side, no, you don't learn a, a lot of that. Wow. Well, I'm thankful. Thank you for your interest in it. Had, had you heard either, because you, you, have, were you always, did you always live in Tennessee? Have you always lived there? No, I'm originally from Georgia, from Atlanta. Okay. But you kind of lived in the, the Southern region yep. of the United States. So yep. growing up there, being educated there, have you heard a lot about veganism? Nope. <laughs> Especially not, yeah, not in Georgia. Um, a lot of my family there um, from South Georgia. And so a lot of the, the food is, you know, the traditional, what we call the soul food. So, you know, it's a lot of uh, more of the traditional fried food and heavy food and and mac and cheese. And um, even the vegetables a lot of the time are are cooked in meat and seasoned with meat and uh, meat products of that that sort. So yeah, veganism was was very far-fetched of a thing. I don't think I really even uh, met anyone who, who may have even been vegan until I was, uh, in college or so. <laughs> yeah. And so what I, that's kind of what I thought. Cause you kind of live in the bacon bills. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 
Yeah, you can definitely find find bacon and, and fried chicken easier than you can find a vegan spot. So, yeah. Oh my, oh my. That's, well, that is amazing. So, you know, it, you, you can eat all those things you mentioned in a healthier form. Yep, definitely. You certainly can. Yeah. And so what, you know, what's come about is that plant-based based eating isn't just for one set of people. You know, plant-based eating can, it's cross-cultural, um, cross-racial, you know, we can transform a lot of those, um, those more traditional diets can be eaten in a much healthier form and a much more plant-friendly, plant-based um, form. You have a lot of um, chefs even now who are coming up with different plant-based cuisines that are, you know, Southern cuisine or Cajun cuisine. Um, we know there's a lot of Asian influence cuisine that's um, definitely plant-based. Um, and even our uh, Latino uh, type of cuisines uh, that you can get some really delicious plant-based food. And so that's the great thing about it is, is that every Everyone can benefit um, from this way of eating and, and not just, you know, a certain group of people. Yeah. Your patients, do they come specifically to see you because they're interested in more of a lifestyle medicine approach? Yeah, many of my patients do. Many of them have um, either been, you know, diagnosed with some of these chronic diseases or have been told that they may be on their way to some of these chronic diseases and they want to, you know, some of those who are already on several medications and they, you know, don't want to have to take all of these things or they're concerned about what you know, their future may be holding. And so they want to make these changes and these differences. Um, and then those that don't, you know, so I'm just, come just for basic uh, primary care. And those that don't, then we do. Uh, I provide a wellness exam to everyone. I think everyone should have a primary care physician and everyone should see a doctor at least once a year, whether you're sick or not, just as a kind of like you take your car to be serviced and get a checkup <laughs> kind of deal. Yeah. And so that way we're able to find some of these things before they get really bad. Except I think most people take better care of their cars than they do their own bodies. They, they absolutely do. I can agree. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, is you can always get another car. I mean, they may be expensive, but you could get another car. Right. You can't get another body. You surely cannot. Yeah. You, you, you can re reinvent your body, you know, somewhat, if you will, uh, before the, uh, the damage is severely done. But yeah, you certainly can't. Yeah. Did you notice any changes in your own health or how you felt when you be became fully plant-based? Yep, I sure did. Um, so not only, you know, I talked about those stomach cramps that I used to have. And so that definitely went away and improved. And then I gained more energy. I've, you know, got more energized and I got just more into, uh, even been more mindful about what I'm putting in my body and how I'm treating my body. Uh, uh, since that time, I uh, started endurance training and I went on and ran marathons and did Ironman um, triathlon races and things just because I, I felt good. Because when, you know, we know when we eat good, we feel good. And what we, we put in, we're able to, you know, produce out those, those uh, things out of our body. And so it was, it was very helpful for me to, to make those changes. Were you able to make changes within your family? I know you have three children and I'm assuming probably yeah. husband's there too. Yeah. 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 My husband and my, and my children, um, they have seen these benefits also, um, to, uh, my, my mom, she actually often jokes about, I, I don't know what to feed your kids because they eat weird food, <laughs> but they do, they, they like beans, they like tofu, um, <laughs> you know? yeah, um, so yeah, I have been able to incorporate these things. I believe they're all all, all boys, right? Yep, they are. Uh -huh. did, 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 they, did you ever show them the movie? I don't know how old they are, but did you ever show them the movie Game Changers? <laughs> yeah, my, they are. So right now they are 12, 8, and 5. And so my oldest, uh, my 12-year-old, he has seen the movie Game Changers. Yeah. And I, I think Game Changers is great. I actually did a viewing from my clinic um, where people could come watch Game Changers. And we talked about, you know, those changes and, and how uh, those nutritional benefits uh, play a part in health. And I think it was great to see the, the endurance athletes and the Olympians and things that they showed in that uh, documentary. It was a well done documentary entry. Yeah. yeah. It, do do yeah. they feel different or weird eating this way, especially in the South? They, they don't. And really it's one of those things because that's what they know. 
you know, they, they, they've grown up the, you know, the five-year-old, he's grown up eating uh, chickpea noodles. So, you know, he, he doesn't know that they're chickpea noodles. He just knows it's his noodles that he likes to eat. <laughs> so, that's yeah, so that, that's what they know. And so they, they don't, you know, they don't really question it. Do you, how do you have time? I mean, obviously you're busy, you have a medical practice, yeah. a family. How do you have time for self-care and feeding your family healthy? How, how do you do it? Yeah. So uh, thanks to people like you, um, <laughs> your, your recipes, your videos. Um, I remember attending um, uh, one of the plant-based uh, conferences uh, several years back where you were actually featured there and you did a, a, a cooking demonstration using the Instapot. Um, and I was like, oh, I got to have one of those. <laughs> and so I did. I, I went and purchased one and oh, it, it's amazing. It's great. So, you know, you just put stuff in there and you go, you go take a shower, go do whatever you need to do. Um, and your food is done and you can create all of these wonderful things. And so things of that nature, just, you know, following people like yourself and a lot of our other uh, plant-based um, influencers and chefs and cooks. Um, I'm also a big fan of Happy Herbivore and you guys make it make it easy, you know, make it doable and make it easy um, to eat this way. I I was looking at your credentials, not so much your medical credentials, which of course are impressive graduating magna cum laude, but I think I'm even more impressed with all the marathons you've done. Yeah. Yeah. So I've, I've done um, a number of them. I, I, and it's one of the things that, you know, I didn't grow up as an athlete. I wasn't much of an athlete. I wasn't a runner, definitely. Um, and so after I had my oldest and then, um, you know, picking up plant-based health and incorporating that um, into my my diet. And then I got into where I wanted to run and I actually enjoyed running and just went on and I started with the 5k and got bitten by the bug and <laughs> there I was doing a marathon. And then, you know, after that became just uh, monotonous for me. Then I said, okay, let's do a triathlon because I need a bit more of a challenge in my life. <laughs> so, yeah. That is, that's incredible. And do you still have time to, to, to even exercise every day? I do. And I won't say every day, but I do several days of the week. Um, I do. I definitely enjoy riding my bike. Um, You know, just we here in Chattanooga, we have one of the things I love about Chattanooga is that it's very outdoor friendly. We have the river here. um, And so there are several trails. There's uh, trail running, there's uh, rock climbing, there's paddleboarding, all these things that you can do outside. So I love being outdoors. Um, And so riding my bike across our uh, multiple trails here in town or running on those trails, it's just a lot of fun and it doesn't even feel like exercise you know a lot of times I just say I'm not going to go out and go get on my paddle board or I'm going to go ride my bike kind of thing. Wow I noticed you also are board certified in obesity medicine talk about that a little bit because that's a, like my grandfather went to medical school in 1920 I believe and wow. he didn't have that specialty right. that. they yep. didn't need it. Yep. Right. Yep. So it is. It's a definitely a newer um, specialty of medicine. And what it is, is where we are now recognizing obesity as a chronic disease and not so much as, you know, just something we used to just label people by, if you will. But we're actually recognizing it as a chronic disease. And with that comes more studies and learning on how um, not only to prevent it, but how to treat um, those suffering from obesity. And what that, what we found over the years with the science in obesity medicine is that there are certain um, triggers in our brain. There are certain um, genetic factors that play um, into a part of obesity. And what we've learned is that um, over, you know, over time, there are ways that we can uh, we can treat these this this disease as if we would treat diabetes, for instance. Um, and so it's it's been a very helpful fellowship to learn and to learn the science behind um, why one may develop obesity and what we can do about it. A lot of it um, plays a part into what's on our plate. Um, you know, even over trying trying to overcome those genetic factors. But if we were really, really eating a whole natural diet, you know, without sugar, oil, salt, like our ancestors did, would they really develop it? I mean, truly. Um, I will say some would, honestly, from the, from the genetic factors that we know, but would we have millions of Americans who suffer from it like we do now? No, we absolutely would not. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Because I mean, at some point you got to say, hey, you know, maybe it's what you're eating. 
Exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Now, and I've got some slides on that and I'm happy to. to oh, I'd love to see your slides, but also just so I don't forget to ask, do you take in-person patients or virtual patients? What is your practice like? In case yeah. Are- yep, for sure. So I actually do both. Um, I see people virtually. Um, I'm licensed in several states, so it's all detailed on my website. Um, and so I am uh, able to see people virtually for virtual uh, consults. And then I also see patients here in town in Chattanooga in person. Nice. I've never been. Uh, yeah, I've been to Nashville, but I've never been to Chattanooga. Oh, you've got to come on down the road. We're, we're two hours south. Wow. Do you, do you have, are there any vegan restaurants or any vegan community there? We do. Yeah. We have a, a group called Chatta Vegans. Um, and so there are our, our big group here in town that they hold um, festivals. And then they also, um, also reach out to the restaurants to try to get them to even add more plant-based foods on their menus. And so they've been great about kind of lobbying the, the local restaurants to add um, more options onto their menus um, for our community. And then we have several uh strictly plant-based restaurants in town. Um, they are delicious food. They're, we have Sluggos, which is one of our older ones, um, Real Roots, um, Plant Power Cafe, Cashew, uh, and your local seat in this. So we've got several, which uh, I think, you know, for a town the size of Chattanooga, it's actually pretty great to have that in your restaurant. That is so cool. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah, I love it. You want to share your slides? Let's do it. All right. <laughs> making sure can you see them yep let food be thy medicine all right yeah so that's the topic about food being medicine all right and so it starts with really um let food be thy medicine is is really one of my my favorite quotes um for preventative health um brought and it's an old quote by Hippocrates you know we know Hippocrates is our father of medicine if you will um and it just speaks to that resounding thing that we can prevent and reverse chronic disease with our diet um as a primary care family physician, I'm often the one to diagnose someone with hypertension, diabetes, high cholesterol, um, and just many of my patients, they seek answers for me to treat these conditions. Um, and many of those solutions, which we know are on our plates, so we'll discuss that. Uh, so that adage of you are what you eat um, is actually true. What we put in our bodies is very important. The most commonly suffered chronic diseases causing illness and death are related to our lifestyle and the foods that we consume. So we'll venture a little bit into learning more about what chronic disease is and talk about some of our chronic, our common chronic diseases, just for those out there who, who may not know um, kind of more of the medical science. And then we'll talk about um, eating our way off of these medications. Um, so this information was gathered from Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Uh, what is chronic disease exactly? So chronic disease um, is broadly defined as a condition uh, that lasts one uh, or more years, and it requires ongoing medical attention or it limits activities of daily living or both of those things. Most Americans have at least one chronic disease, um, over 60%, which you know is a lot. And then in the United States, our leading chronic diseases causing disability and death are heart disease, cancer, and diabetes. And these same diseases also drive up our overall healthcare costs. I'm sure most of our viewers and listeners today know at least one person, whether it be a friend or a family member, with at least one of the diseases noted on this slide, because all races, rigid religions, socioeconomic groups, everyone's affected um, by these chronic diseases. I'll start with talking about diabetes. So over 34 million Americans have diabetes, uh, which is a disease in which the amount of sugar in your blood is too high. Even more concerning, more than 88 million U.S. adults have prediabetes, which is a condition where blood sugar is on the rise, but not at a diabetic level. And studies show that 90% of individuals don't know that they even have an elevated blood sugar, which also speaks to the fact that most individuals don't seek preventative care, therefore leaving conditions to worsen and wreak more havoc on the body. High blood sugar affects numerous organs in our body, leading to heart disease, blindness, kidney failure, limb amputations, and even death. High blood pressure, 
nearly one out of um, every two adults have high blood pressure, hypertension. High blood pressure is a condition in which the force of the blood as it flows through our blood vessels and it's pushing against those walls of our blood vessels, it's consistently way too high. When this force gets too high, it overworks the heart and causes damage to our blood vessels over time, leading to heart failure, stroke, heart attacks, vision loss, and even kidney damage. It's often referred to as the silent killer because much of this damage is done without one notice, without one even noticing that they're having any symptoms of high blood pressure. Hyperlipidemia or high cholesterol is when our body is making too much of this fatty waxy substance causing plaque deposits to build up and line our blood vessels, making it challenging for blood to freely flow through the vessels. Mammals naturally make cholesterol, which is why everyone has a cholesterol count of something within their body. However, when we consume these other animals, animal-based products, we gain an excess of cholesterol. This excess leads to, begins to line our blood vessels, blocking blood flow and leading to heart attacks, strokes, and aneurysms. Heart disease is actually the number one cause of death in the United States. COVID gave it a run for its money at, at one while, but uh, we came through, but it is heart disease. Um, and all of the aforementioned conditions increases one's risk for heart disease. This picture is just a little more illustrative way of, of how our food affects our bodies and organs. I like to, to show people this picture because I think it kind of brings it home. Um, so this is just starting kind of with what we eat when we eat these foods that contain fat, carbohydrates, proteins, um, they go into our mouth, we chew them up, then the digestive process starts, uh, starts here with our liver, uh, with those carbohydrates and proteins um, being broken down into triglycerides, um, and then further down into cholesterol. And this is some of what we see when we have our cholesterol panel done by our doctor. Um, further digestion occurs with the intestines breaking down these nutrients and taking those fats um, and those, uh, I'm sorry, and those triglyceride molecules and then adding that um, cholesterol so that you can further process it. Eventually, we end up storing these things. If it's not used by our body, then it's going to be stored um, for later use, um, whether that be that we actually use it later or it just stores as fat. Now, cancer, we often don't actually think of cancer as a lifestyle disease, and certainly not all cancers are going to be lifestyle related. However, many of our common cancers that Americans suffer from, like breast cancer, colorectal cancer, liver cancer, um, can certainly be affected by diet and lifestyle. So, now let's talk about how we can use food as medicine instead of using food as a disease causing tool. So the basics of a healthful meal are found in this picture. If we take a look at it, sticking with a whole food plant-based diet, a rainbow of colors like in this picture, a variety of food groups can ensure health and healthful eating. And um, those who follow a plant-based diet, uh, well, you know, these food groups should look familiar. So fruits, for sure, vegetables, um, those two vegetables, which are our potatoes and yams, carrots, our legumes, our beans, and then our whole grains. Um, and you want your whole grains to be as, as least processed um, as you can get them. So not your whole grain in the form of white bread, for instance, but more of a sprouted grain type of food. Now, for those suffering from diabetes, prediabetes, or other high blood sugar related conditions and high cholesterol even, um, let's look at those dietary changes. Fiber is going to be the key here um, for those conditions. Because the body is unable to quickly break down and absorb high fiber foods, it doesn't cause our blood sugar to spike in the way other carbohydrates like candy or sugar sweet desserts, for instance, can. And this can help to keep one's blood sugar stable instead of the roller coaster uh, where people have these spikes and lows of their blood sugar, which over time we know can be damaging to the body, which is why diabetes becomes so damaging to the body. Fiber also acts as a sweeper. It helps to clean the digestive tract 
and it helps to prevent cholesterol plaques from forming in the blood vessels. And in these pictures are some of our more high fiber foods that we can consume um, to naturally lower blood sugar. Uh, if we look kind of even just, you know, I've been practicing for 12 years and even over just the time from when I um, started earlier uh, in practice and earlier in training, a lot of the teaching of diabetics was, oh, you can't eat fruit or, oh, you can't eat um, oatmeal or any carbohydrates. But what we know is that they can eat fruit. They can eat oatmeal. I mean, actually, they should be eating these things because of the fiber in these foods and because it actually helps to stabilize blood sugar. It, it, it doesn't. Um, now, no, you don't want your fruit in syrup. You don't want, you know, a canned fruit. But if you're eating a whole pear or a whole apple, um, then yes, you can certainly have those things and it'll help your blood sugar. Just more here on uh, focusing on the fiber, focusing on legumes, cruciferous vegetables, whole fruit, leafy greens to get your fiber, lower your blood sugar and, and reduce your cholesterol. Um, the slide also has some good tips about how those, um, those sources that tend to be more unknown uh, that contain high amounts of sugar to stay away from. So a lot of our condiments, if you've ever looked at the package of ketchup, ketchup has a, a lot of sugar in it. So using uh, tomatoes or um, just tomato sauce, something that you've made on your own uh, with a blender instead of using a prepackaged ketchup, a can of soda would be higher in sugar, a sport drink for sure. Um, and then uh, a lot of the things that we already know, cookies and pies and sweets, um, but replacing those things with fresh fruits, uh, drinking, instead of drinking your calories, getting a, a large latte or frappuccino full of sugar, uh, getting some soda water or something sugar-free, black coffee instead of uh, the alternative there. And let's talk about salt. And I know Chef AJ's viewers have definitely heard about the detriments of sugar, salt, and fat if they've been following Chef AJ. Uh, but excess salt can certainly lead to elevated blood pressure, kidney failure, heart disease, headaches, and more. Um, and if you're wanting to improve your health because you need to improve your blood pressure or you need um, to lower your blood pressure to prevent uh, the kidney damage that you may already be showing some early signs of, you want to start to use spices instead of salt. You want to try using dried herbs um, instead of salt to season your food. You also want to avoid naturally salty foods, um, like processed foods, for instance. In processed foods, salt is often used as a preservative. So choosing raw or whole foods, um, when you're going to the grocery store, choosing those foods uh, that are out fresh instead of those things that are on the shelf. Um, those foods that are on the shelf are going to require preservatives. So we'll, majority of the time, we'll have some added salt to it. Uh, choosing to cook more of your meals at home instead of purchasing from a restaurant. Restaurants are designed to make food palatable to you. So they add sugar, salt, and fat to feed those more happy hormone receptors in our brain. Um, and we know food addiction is an entirely uh, additional topic, but this plays a part in why restaurant food is not helpful to consume for the majority of our meals uh, because of that high sugar, salt, and fat content um, that we're going to get and it's not going to be overall helpful for us. Another way that food can be used as medicine, for instance, with high blood pressure, uh, potassium rich foods can be helpful in lowering our blood pressure. Potassium actually works through channels in the body to push salt out and it helps to relax the walls of those blood, uh, of those blood vessels for making that pressure be too high uh, and thereby it's helpful to lower your blood pressure. And these are just certainly some really um, healthful foods, healthy, nutritious foods that can be eaten um, to lower blood pressure um, just by what's on your plate. So food can be used as a tool for medicine, just as well as it can be used for a tool for disease. Really, the choice is yours and the essence of health is in you. Thank you. Let me stop sharing. That was yeah, so great. Back. It's so funny that, yeah, that, that was a wonderful presentation. And even before you started uh, talking, there was a question from a live viewer about high blood pressure. Let me find it. And maybe you can, no, no, you can't give like obviously specific medical advice, but maybe you could just mm -hmm. speak to it in general. 
she had asked something about why, uh, here it is from uh, Ricky, why does my blood pressure stay high? I'm on medication and vegan for three years. I asked her in the chat if she eats any salt, but I haven't heard back yet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because like you, for sure, like you said, in one of the parts in her question, I see that she said she eats vegan. Um, and a lot of times I do make a point to kind of break down for people the difference in vegan and whole food plant-based. Um, you know, a lot of our, our vegan just really means that it doesn't uh, have any animal products, but vegan can still include a lot of salty foods, can include a lot of oil um, in the diet. And so I don't know if, if you know, if that's this particular person's story, but if they're eating a lot of processed vegan foods, um, a lot of the meat replacement um, vegan foods, and they still may be getting way too much salt and way too much oil, um, thereby still keeping their blood pressure high, even though they aren't eating those animal products, which could be hindering um, their blood pressure from improving. Yeah, absolutely. Because I've seen people, I used to work at the True North Health Center where they do therapeutic medically supervised water only fasting. And when they get off all the junk, I, I've seen, you know, the blood pressure go down and people be able to get off their medication. Right. Yep. Yep. For sure. Yeah, definitely, you know, plays a, a part in exactly what we're eating and exactly how we're eating. Um, you know, honestly, which is one of the reasons why I started more of the nutrition coaching too, because I would get people who say, well, I've been eating vegan and, you know, it's not doing anything. Um, and so, you know, getting people to know actually more in detail of what really that healthful plate should look like and, and that it's not just vegan, but there is, you know, more to that. Right. Absolutely. Speaking of eating, like, what do you eat in a day? Yeah. Um, so it, it, honestly, it's going to depend on how busy I am. <laughs> uh, for today, I've, I've had my coffee and I've had my green juice, which I've been working on thus far. Uh, but typically, if I'm going to have uh, a lunch, I do like to have salad. Um, I'm also a bean noodle fan. So I like chickpea noodles and lentil noodles. Um, and I'll typically put like some uh, roasted spinach in it uh, or some broccoli with it. Um, I sprinkle it over some nutritional yeast um, to give it a little bit more flavor. And then I do like a lot of Asian inspired dishes. So um, I do like to, you know, spice things up with uh, ginger or some of the fresh ginger or put some of the more Asian type of seasonings um, on my food um, that way. Uh, dinner is typically, you know, gotta be some version of, of what lunch may have been. Um, I do like uh, rice bowls too. I like to do some brown rice um, with uh, black beans. Um, I'm a big fan of sweet potatoes and I, I probably eat sweet potatoes in a weird way from others. I do like my sweet potatoes uh, with a little peanut butter over the top and then apples. I chop fresh apples and heat them up. <laughs> so, and, uh, so, you know, it, but it's how I like to eat my, my sweet potatoes that way. Um, yeah. I don't think and that's then, weird at all because at the McDougal program, oh, they used to, Mary McDougal used to make a peanut sauce for the sweet potatoes. So I don't think that's weird yeah, at all. I've never even seen that, but it makes sense. <laughs> no, I mean, it sounds yeah. delicious. Yeah, I, I think it is personally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a question from a live viewer. If you work with patients with sarcoidosis. Yes. Um, yes, yeah, so sarcoidosis, we do know, is an autoimmune disease, and um, yes, and we know, you know, some of our autoimmune conditions can certainly be treated and certainly uh, prevent flares of autoimmune disease with a whole food plant-based diet. Right. Uh, Latanya says, what can I do if I've recently been diagnosed as anemic on a whole food plant-based diet? Get to the root. Yep. Exactly. So it depends on what it is. So first of all, you have to, to know what type of anemia it is. So is it an iron deficient anemia or is it more of a, um, a macrocytic anemia, which is more of a B12 deficiency type of anemia. And so really, you know, this person is going to want to work with their doctor to determine what type of anemia it is and what's causing it. And then there's anemia of chronic disease. So if this person already has um, diabetes, for instance, or has some kidney damage, then they could have anemia just based on that chronic disease. And so that's going to determine how you're going to be able to tackle that. But if you're just, you know, kind of basic iron deficient um, anemia, then you're going to want to choose more iron rich foods. So you're going to want uh, beans, for instance, for example, are high in iron. Um, our dark leafy greens um, are going to be higher in iron. 
Um, so consuming more of those type of foods um, in your diet to help to boost those iron levels. Uh, if it's B12, then you're going to need a supplement. B12 is one of those things that it is hard to find in the diet. I even see a lot of times where meat eaters will even be B12 deficient. So um, that's one where, you know, definitely a supplement will come in handy. Nice. Thanks. Is it true that like when you put vitamin C with the greens, it helps with the iron absorption? Yep. Yeah. So the vitamin C does help to improve iron absorption. So if you, um, for instance, if you eat your beans, then uh, eating like a, a bell pepper with it, something that has the vitamin C source or uh, squirting some lemon juice or something over it, it's going to help you to absorb the iron from that food a bit better. Yeah. And it will actually taste better anyway. Yep. That too. <laughs> yeah. Cause I was watching some of your videos and uh, on your YouTube channel. And I know you like, you had one where you like put lemon on things, just that, uh -huh. that makes things just better. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. it you know, it, it brings that, um, and you're the chef, so I'll leave it to you. But when we talk about, you know, like the salt kind of flavor out of things, I think oh, yeah. lemon actually helps to kind of give you some of that, that flavor. It there. does. I agree hundred percent lemon and lime. I think it has something to do with the taste buds for sour sitting next to the taste buds for salt, but I love to put a, like if I'm having soup or salad or toast, I just love putting a squeeze of lemon or lime on everything. It yep. just makes it pop. Yeah. Yeah, so it really does. One of the live viewers said that you have in your slideshow, which showed chronic diseases, chronic lung disease was included. Can you talk about how diet and lifestyle can help people with chronic lung disease? Yeah, for sure. Um, and so with lung disease, it's kind of, you know, that's kind of the umbrella of it. It's kind of depend on what it is. So for example, um, if you're a smoker, you're going to want to stop smoking because we do know, you know, that smoking is going to lead to uh, lung disease and lung cancer. Um, but on the other hand, if it's something more like asthma, for instance, we can reduce flares of asthma with our diet and with our lifestyle. Um, a lot of times our asthma folks will also have a lot of allergies and sensitivities. Um, and what plays a, a part into that a lot of the times uh, dairy, for instance, can cause more mucus, can cause us to build more mucus um, and which can affect our breathing. Um, and then a lot of our meat and dairy can also cause more uh, inflammation and cause more flares of those allergy symptoms, which can thereby trigger those asthma symptoms. So cutting those things down. A lot of uh, my asthmatics, a lot of times, will also have eczema. Um, and so cutting out the, um, the dairy and the meat products can also cut down those flares um, that go along with the asthma. And so, yeah, it definitely plays a part as well as, you know, even just kind of beyond the obvious of our weight. If you also, um, you know, suffer from obesity and you have asthma, that's going to just compound your trouble with breathing. So it'll be important to change those dietary habits so that you can also improve, improve your lung function that way. Right. She's saying the specific disease she's questioning about is idiopathic pulmonary disease. Okay. Um, so idiopathic would mean that they don't know what caused it, um, unfortunately. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of it is just going to depend on, you know, what they may be suffering from. But either way, uh, just cutting down, like I said, for instance, those dairy products to to cut down on the amount of mucus that you're making so that you can breathe better um, with less of that will, will make a big difference. Um, and watching those uh, more inflammatory foods. So foods with oil um, will tend to cause inflammation within the body um, and can affect all of our organs in the body. So eating more anti-inflammatory foods. So our, our berries are gonna be high in um, antioxidants and anti-inflammation, um, our dark leafy greens too. Um, and those things can in turn help. Great. Thank you. Uh, Alyssa says, do you have any tips for working with neuropathy? Yep. So it, it, once again, it's going to depend on what's causing the neuropathy. Uh, diabetes is a common cause of neuropathy um, in a lot of people in this country. So really improving your blood sugars will help to um, reduce the amount of discomfort from the neuropathy and will help to prevent the neuropathy from progressing. Uh, so, you know, like we talked about in the slideshow, um, in terms of if your neuropathy is coming from diabetes, you really want to consume more of those high fiber foods to get your blood sugars more stabilized um, and to prevent those spikes. So you want to eat more on the, the low glycemic side of things. Um, you want the unsweetened oats. You want to think of 
foods where your body has to work hard to process it. You don't want um, foods that are already so processed where your body doesn't have to do much work because those are the things that are going to spike your blood sugars more. Yep. Okay. Well, I mean, this next question, I think you could spend a whole hour talking about it. So maybe just speak to it a little bit. But James says, how does the digestive system affect all the other systems in the body? Oh, boy. Okay. Um, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we need a whole yeah. summit. We actually, right. I did a whole summit on that called the GI health summit. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, our digestive system, it, it's going to be a part, you're going to look at it from a couple of ways. So one is if your body's able to break down whatever you're consuming, um, if your digestive system is able to do that, because if it's not able to break down whatever you're consuming, you're not going to get much uh, benefit from it. And then the other part of breaking it down is absorbing um, what you're consuming and what your body is able to then go and, and do with that product. Um, so for instance, even, you know, just talking about B12 deficiency is one of the things we talked about. Um, and so it's one of those disorders where we know that um, some people just aren't able to absorb it within the gut, even though they may be um, consuming it. For instance, like I said, some of my meat eating patients uh, will still have a low B12 because their gut isn't absorbing it, um, even though they're consuming these meat products. And so that's, you know, our digestive system will definitely um, affect our different organs from that way if we're able to absorb the certain nutrients that we're putting in our body um, from that standpoint. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Susanna wants to know, uh, do you have any suggestions for how to help patients, oh, not sorry, parents, <laughs> uh, 79 and 80 with multiple lifestyle diseases, blood pressure, type two cholesterol, they eat sad and they don't think food is connected to health. Yeah. And I will, you know, honestly say that that population can be a bit challenging. And you have to think of it from a historical perspective. You know, most of our individuals now who are 70, 80 years old, they kind of grew up um, seeing the commercials about, you know, milk doing a body good and, you know, you beef is what's for dinner and, you know, kind of all of these catchy things that they, they grew up on and they came to know as their, their way of life and their way of eating. Um, but, you know, it, it starts honestly one meal at a time. So, and, and I will even take it away from just saying that age group to anyone. So anyone that I am, uh, talking to newly about starting on a plant-based diet, one of the things I look at is what they already like to eat, for instance. So, you know, what do you typically eat for breakfast? Oh, I eat scrambled eggs and bacon. Okay, well, maybe let's try a tofu scramble or let's try just a vegetable scramble and, um, you know, then maybe have you do a piece of whole grain toast with it. See if you like that instead. Um, let's try a bowl of, you know, whole grain cereal instead. See if you like that. Or let's try a smoothie. And then we go, oh, what do you typically eat for lunch? Oh, I, you know, may have a burger or um, I may have a turkey sandwich or, you know, something of that nature. Then let's look for ways that we can redo that. So really take it one meal, one step at a time, instead of telling that person, oh, you just got to stop doing all of that. You know, you got to stop, just throw this out. Don't do this. Don't do that. But taking it one meal and showing them how each meal, you know, oh, you like tacos? Tacos are your favorite food. Great. We can do a lot of things with tacos <laughs> you know? and showing them how they can, can recreate that to make it more helpful um, for them. Um, a lot of times just cooking it. A lot of times people are afraid to try something new. Um, you know, change is hard, uh, especially, uh, you know, as we age, change is hard. So just having it to present before them. So I already have that meal cooked and just let them try it. A lot of times don't even tell them, don't label it as vegan. It's, oh, that's one of the things I've definitely learned over the years um, with family. Don't label it as vegan because they're going to automatically see it as weird. Just say, this is a dish. You can eat it <laughs> kind of thing. I think food is so highly addictive for so many people. And I think that is why they don't want to change. They yeah. just, yeah. you know, uh, Lori says, do you ever eat snacks or dessert? And what about foods like air pop popcorn? Okay. Yeah. So air pop popcorn um, is definitely fine to eat if you um, aren't, you know, having any health conditions that would prevent you from eating that. Typically air pop popcorn, you aren't going to have any oil in it. Um, so yeah, it should be fine to eat uh, popcorn. Corn has fiber. Um, 
in it, that's fine. Uh, other snacks that I like um, are the roasted chickpeas. Um, I like uh, kale chips, um, which are, you know, just the roasted pieces of kale um, that you can get. Um, fruit, I, I definitely, you know, I'm the type of person who'll go grab an apple <laughs> just because uh, I, I like things of that nature. Uh, so yeah, they're definitely ways that you can still snack. And then when it comes to desserts, honestly, I, I like to follow a lot of um, Chef AJ's. I learned about uh, date syrup and <laughs> those things from you and how to bake um, and make things based from those ingredients. So really, yeah, when, I, when I'm wanting a dessert, I like to um, do things of that nature. I play around a bit with beans or um, some date syrup, bananas, um, and make different things that way. Yeah. Well, your sweet potato and apple combination, one of the viewers loves yeah. that. That almost <laughs> tastes like dessert anyway, you know? It really does. Uh -huh. Yeah. 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 Um, any recommendations to avoid losing weight because of hyperthyroidism? Yeah. Yep. And I've certainly had people um, too, who I've had as patients who, um, you know, have changed their diet and then all of a sudden they're just wasting away from us, um, which, you know, can have its own set of health issues too. Uh, so yeah. So in that case, then you want to look at caloric density and you want to eat more um, foods that uh, will tend to be more dense foods. So foods like uh, nuts, you know, you can definitely add a scoop more of peanut butter to your meals, add more beans to your meals. Um, avocado um, can add a bit more of those healthy fats um, so that you don't lose too much weight um, that way. Right. Basically, just do the opposite of everything I tell people. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> Yeah. So that's actually how we met. I think we were we were both speaking to this subject. I think that's where we met was um, we were, we're one of the New York organizations. Uh -huh. And then I said, yeah. oh, she's lovely. I'd love to have her on the show. Yeah, we were actually we were talking about caloric density, but mm -hmm. in the other way, how to right. actually lose weight. So exactly. there's a question. Does coffee contribute to high blood pressure? I've heard Dr. McDougal say maybe to higher cholesterol, but I've never I don't know if it has enough. Well, it's and it's really not so much the, the coffee bean itself, it's the caffeine that can contribute to the high blood pressure. Caffeine, um, if, you know, think of it as any other kind of drug, it's a stimulant. And so within that, then it can raise blood pressure. So those people who may suffer from high blood pressure and have trouble controlling their blood pressure, then yeah, you will want to choose more of a decaffeinated option um, instead of traditional regular co uh, coffee. Yeah. Do you you, when you have patients that really aren't that interested in lifestyle, or, or should I say, don't come to you for that specifically, do you still manage to kind of sneak it in the conversation somehow? Yeah, <laughs> I do. Uh, from a standpoint, you know, I have some people who, who, you know, may not come for me for that. But um, like I said, uh, you know, as a family physician, I recommend everybody just have, have a routine physical. And so people, you know, may not come to me with any health conditions or anything. They just may even be coming just for a pap smear, for instance. Um, and then we do a panel of labs and, you know, they may be in that pre-diabetic range. Like I talked about, the majority of people don't know that they're actually pre-diabetic. And then that's a perfect time to, you know, toss that in there. Well, you know, you're blood sugar is showing a little bit of elevation. And here are some things that we can do to start now at preventing this before it does become to a diabetes level. Um, and then I have some people who may even come in for um, just a rash, you know, like we talked about with eczema. And that's a, a time too, where I talk to people about, oh, you know, cutting that dairy out of your diet can help to uh, reduce your flares of eczema here. And so, you know, that would be helpful there. Um, and then I talk about, you know, in my practice, I talk about a, a, even beyond just diet. Um, for instance, if someone's having back pain, I tell them how they can incorporate yoga and incorporate, um, you know, certain stretching exercises and getting moving and walking more and those things to help combat um, chronic back pain and some other um, chronic musculoskeletal issues. And so um, even beyond just diet, um, intentional movement is important um, in our overall lifestyle and sleep is very important too in our over life, overall lifestyle and preventing uh, these chronic diseases. Thank you. Linda wants to know, have you ever been able to get any other doctors to go plant-based? Um, I haven't actually pushed any other, any other doctors, I will say, um, <laughs> to go, to go plant-based. Uh, but on the same turn, I will say, I'm finding that more and more doctors are 
um, leaning more to a plant-based approach um, than there have ever been because commonly, uh, you know, a lot of times I'm in different social media groups and things, and there are more and more doctors who are seeing the, the studies come out, especially when the American Heart Association kind of came out uh, about a year or so ago, um, you know, finally agreeing that, yes, plant-based was the way to go. And a lot of doctors now um, are jumping on board and, and promoting this with their patients. Um, but I personally have not just kind of evangelized um, to a doctor. Nice. Here's a cooking question from Amy. How do you keep the roasted chickpeas from getting mushy when storing them? Mine lose their crunch. I air fry mine, so they don't seem to lose their crunch. Ah, but... Okay. Because I have had that same problem. And uh, is it Amy, I typically just cook a small batch so that, because I have had that problem when you do store them that they do, but I've never tried air frying them. So yeah, now I, yeah maybe I try that because that seems so, to, yeah. that seems to keep them pretty crunchy. Yeah. Yeah. Good to know. <laughs> okay. So Lori says at what age can women who have had a hysterectomy stop their annual pap smears? Okay. So uh, first it's going to depend on why you had the hysterectomy. Um, so typically rule of thumb is if you had a hysterectomy for benign reasons, for example, just like fibroids, which are common in a lot of women, um, then you don't need um, another pap smear because what uh, pap smears are looking for is cervical cancer. And if you don't have a cervix, then you don't need to look for cervical cancer in someone who had, you know, benign pathology and didn't have any cancerous conditions. However, if your hysterectomy was related to anything cancerous or even precancerous, then that's certainly a discussion you're going to want to have with your doctor because that makes the situation different for you. Um, and so you may, even after a hysterectomy, you may still need um, routine pap smears. Oh, great. Oh, Angela says, I love this doctor. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you. You seem very chill. You seem like you have a very calm, like, like a you know, very like calmness to you. I, I try to. My husband may say otherwise, um, <laughs> but I, I do. I, I do try to, um, you know, just keep a calm demeanor, honestly, especially when we're talking about this stuff, because I think, you know, it's just it's all about helping people and just, you know, helping people to make these changes and to help us all live more happier and healthier lives. And, you know, it's just something that we can feel good about and it, we don't have to, you know, be overly anxious about it because it is it's something that we can feel good about telling people about. Yeah. Um, Dave says, doctor, my wife is trying to control her type two diabetes with this way of eating and her sugar levels are all over the place, depending on what she eats. Mm. A little clue there. Anything yeah. she needs to not consume or consume more of. Yeah. So she's probably consuming too many foods that are higher on the glycemic index. Um, and so this particular person probably actually wants to, you know, look up. There's several charts that'll kind of help you with what glycemic index is and, and foods that are higher on the glycemic index. Um, but they want your your wife would want to consume foods that are um, lower on the on the glycemic index. So things, for instance, um, beans, they're going to want more of that. They're going to want more um, oats, like still cut oats um, and they're want to, going to want to consume more of those type of carbohydrates instead of those um, other things. They, and even some diabetics, I do initially have to have them stay away from potatoes, for instance, just because potatoes can be more high glycemic um, and dependent on how bad their diabetes is and how insulin resistant their body has actually become, they may not be able to necessarily tolerate things like potatoes. But if they're choosing things like more of the beans, the um, unprocessed whole grains, those sprouted grains, um, those things are going to those fibrous foods are going to more stabilize those blood sugars and prevent a lot of those spikes. Um, typically, if I have a diabetic who we're seeing a lot of those spikes with, I'll actually have them keep a food journal um, and maybe one of the wearable uh, blood sugar monitors so that we can see, oh, you, you know, you ate a bowl of whatever. And then we saw your sugar go up this high two hours later. And that helps. Great. Thank you. So, um, Lori says, you seem like a wonderful doctor, lucky patient. So if somebody Thank wants you. to become a lucky patient or just follow you, where's the best place to connect with you? Yeah. So if they are um, here in Chattanooga or near Chattanooga and want to come into the clinic, they can find me at essenceofhealthwellnessclinic.com. 
And then for those who are more interested in virtual um, health and nutrition uh, coaching and counseling, they can find me at EOH, which stands for Essence of Health, EOHcoaching.com. And then I'm also on uh, social media. I'm on both Facebook and Instagram at Essence of Health Wellness Clinic. Um, And then my YouTube channel, uh, if you just search Essence of Health. Great. Well, we have a nice uh, plant-based wife says we need more doctors like this. We certainly do. So thank you so much for being plant-based and for all you do. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. Oh, it was so pleasure. fun. And may- maybe come yeah. back sometime and cook something. Yeah, I, I should. I may have to uh, cook my, my sweet potato. <laughs> yeah, some, and, or something your family likes. Yeah. People love things yeah. like that. Yeah, that would sure. be great. Thank you so much. It was so great. Thank you for having me. Of course. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific time when my guest is Venus DeMarco, and she is going to be making a smoky sweet potato mac and cheese.